uh, welcome to the Siemens uh, webinar, which uh, is going to be one of those uh, topics that seems to be pretty hot these days and a lot of people asking questions about this convergence between IT and OT. What does it mean? Uh, what is it? And, um, you know, many of these things have been asked. And, uh, you know, we had a very interesting panel uh, back in, in June where we had uh, a number of folks who've been, been going through some of these things or have been experiencing uh, the programs where the uh, uh, the applications that are really today in smart grid driving this convergence between IT and OT. And the panel was um, uh, conducted in June, as I said, and we will uh, be rolling a video here to uh, to review that panel uh, presentation with you. Um, after the uh, 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 the session, we will uh, we will take some questions and we'll uh, we'll talk uh, live on that. In the meantime, as you heard, you can submit questions to. Uh, uh, through the through the, the platform here, and um, and we will queue those up for for the discussion after the video. So at this point, um, I'd like to go ahead and uh, and roll the video, and uh, thank you for joining us. Okay, well now I'm confused whether I should introduce my panelists as the kids or the rock and rollers. Uh, <laughs> since the instruments aren't here, and I think we're probably not kids anymore, um, I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and introduce them in a second, but. I think um, what you heard there was a vision, and I was tempted to say as we went through this, oh, promises, promises, um, because, in fact, we are making these promises to the people who are investing in smart grid. And I think if you look back at what you heard uh, in the opening uh, remarks today, it's, it's really, it's, it's fundamentally clear that we're not going to be able to deliver on those promises and to, to execute the, the vision of the smart grid without truly, you know, looking at how we do these things from a technological and a cultural and a, and a, and a personal relationship to really operate our uh, utility businesses in, in a different fashion. And so the topic here is, you know, OT and IT, but I think more importantly the topic is about breaking down some of the traditional silos and the operations of the energy business, not just the distribution utilities, but even in some of the other uh, market uh, players. And I think what we've got here is a panel of folks who have actually faced many of those challenges. Uh, they each have a different perspective on what some of those issues are and uh, really in their own businesses have made strides towards achieving some more of the, uh, of the integration across silos than, than a lot of uh, the counterparts because of what they've been doing in, in their own particular businesses. So um, I'm going to go ahead and briefly introduce each one of these guys and ask them to, to, to give a, a, a couple minutes of opening remarks. We're going to go through some questions. If we have time, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try and take some questions from the audience as well. But I'll start off with Kenny Mercado. And, and Kenny is uh, the Senior Vice President of Grid and Market Operations uh, for Centerpoint Energy in Texas. Uh, then we have uh, Bill Mingi from Kansas City Power and Light, who is the Director of Smart Grid Programs at, at Kansas City Power and Light. And we have Tom Kindred, who is the CIO of SAS Power up in Saskatchewan, Canada. And then we have Wade Malcolm, part of the Accenture team and one of our sponsors for the event here. Thank you very much for the, <coughs> the, uh, the previous uh, entertainment. Um, so, again, each of these guys has, has a slightly different perspective on uh, how the systems, how, how the, the processes have to be integrated. Uh, their business models are a little bit different. Of course, we have Wade as, as, a, as a consultant who's uh, advised utilities globally. But uh, what I'd like to do is sort of you know, go through the journey of, well, what have been some of the issues historically? Um, what are we doing about them? Why are we doing these things? And then, you know, what are some of the things that they've learned about this process that I think could be beneficial to the, uh, to the audience? So we're going to be fairly informal, ask a few questions, and just try to get a dialogue going. So, again, if there's going to be questions, uh, we'll try to save some time to, uh, to get some, some input from you guys as well. So I, I want to start off with Kenny. And I, I picked Kenny, and I told him this because specifically his title um, Senior Vice President, Grid and Market Operations, right? Uh, that kind of says a lot to me because we're talking both about the grid and we're talking about the consumer market, as we heard about from Chairman Lowinghoff. So uh, I think to me that sort of signifies uh, that maybe there's been some progress at Centerpoint on, you know, examining those barriers and thinking about what maybe should be changed. So, Kenny, do you want to kick us off and comment on some of the things that historically? I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Lars. Lars and I have been together for probably seven, eight years, so it's, it's nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, the Siemens team for bringing us together. I think it's wonderful to see this audience. I know you all are highly charged on this topic and very interested and probably really engaged in what we have to say. I was thinking for a moment about what is ITOT, and when I was listening to the band play this morning, I kind of put it together. It hit me. You know, the guys back there in the back, that's your IT guys, right? They're, they're doing all the technology work and got all the gadgets and whatnot and doing all the communications. The guys up here in the front, this is the OT. These are the technology guys playing those bands 
playing the band and really getting into the music and doing, doing the field work, really making the work happen in the field. So when you think about ITOT and we start to merge those into one, that's um, I think what this purpose of today's discussion is. Um, one of the songs they played was, was from the band Journey. How many of y'all recognize the Journey band? <laughs> right? A lot of love Journey. I, I go back to the 80s and enjoy the, the music from Journey. But I, I, I want to leave that word with Larsh with us today. I think that this is a journey. I mean, we're, we're really going from an, a, kind of an old utility-based environment, and, and I'm, not to be critical about the, it at all, but a, a, an environment with, with built on legacy, built on old software systems, built on very tailor-made, very specialized, and we're converting in a, in a rapid pace. We're converting to a very new, off-the-shelf, standardized, highly functional world. And uh, as utilities, we have to... We have to swallow all this. It's a lot for us to, to, have to, to have to inject into our systems and try to make it successful. So this is a journey that we're going through. And I'll back up just for a moment and tell you that I've been in the utility industry for 28 years now. Uh, we've worked very hard in, in, in the areas of our utility uh, infrastructure over the years to be as, very, as, to be as efficient and cost-focused uh, as we could around employees and make sure we have the right level of management and employees around process and around the use of technology. I mean, we've been using technology for 30 years. This is not new in, in this space. But the focus of that technology and that, those processes and the, and the very efficient management of people is really in a silo. Whether you worked in the transmission area of, of, of the utility or you worked in the distribution area or you worked in the metering area or you worked in, in information technology, or if you worked in customer service, it's all silos. And unfortunately, it goes one way, right? So it, it, it eventually all comes down and falls in the face of the customer service. They don't have a clue what happened uh, upstream, but the customers are yelling downstream. They want answers. And so that, that's the product that we've been using for a long, long period of time. And now today, we're really kind of revolutionizing. I think you're seeing, seeing this evolving journey where the systems that our, that, our, that our vendors are providing to the utility industry are going to allow us to operate across the chain in a very efficient, transparent, real-time life, real-time environment, so that everybody knows what's going on at every moment of every day. So it's a big, big change. And I know everyone in this room is, is, is feeling those, those, uh, uh, those, those changes in, in your environment where you work. And, and my, my comment to you is when I came to work here 28 years ago, I was an electrical engineer doing electrical engineering work, and I pretty much felt like I was doing the same kind of work as the guy that was here 10 years before me, the guy that was here 10 years before him. It really hadn't changed much. But when we hire an electrical engineer today, that electrical engineer has got a whole different outlook of how to operate the grid because of the new digitized level of performance that we're providing over this journey. So I'll leave it with that, but I think it's just a, it's a very exciting time. This is the best time in my career to be in this space. I'm looking forward to this, this discussion. Bill, I'm, I'm Bill Mangy from Kansas City Power and Light. Uh, KCPNL has had a long history of uh, applying technology. I think Larsh actually was there uh, when uh, we were serial number one for Cellnet's uh, automated meter reading AMR system back in the early 90s. We're at the point now where we're ready to, uh, to replace that technology. And again, a lot of customizations in there that, uh, that are ready to go um, that uh, uh, we need to uh, work more on standards today. Uh, we, uh, most of my time today is spent uh, leading our uh, uh, smart grid demonstration project and um, going off what, uh, what Kenny had to say, our project is basically everything that anybody here would consider um, below the transmission level. You say, well, I think that's part of the smart grid um, outside of prepay, and people will debate whether that's smart grid or not, but the, uh, is, is part of our project. And so we're going across all these silos, and we realize that the silos, a lot of times, they don't even have a window that you can look into to see uh, what's happening on the other side. So you know, we've had a, uh, a, a lot of uh, cross-cultural, cross-functional um, learnings going on through the project. Um, we do have the, the benefit of it being a demonstration project, so it's not a system-wide thing. So we're able to take the, uh, the learnings and as we go forward, be able to apply them to what we're going to do as we go system-wide with, uh, with more of these systems as, uh, as we move forward. So um, again, I'm an electrical engineer as well, and I think that uh, you know, we uh, had uh, uh, a lot of people also back in the days when I was coming up where I, would, where I learned from that guy. 
that sat there. Well, today, when you come up, that guy's not even there anymore to learn from. So Unless it's when, Lisa's grandfather. Right, <laughs> right, right. We, we, we need, uh, um, and, and we do have engineers that do make those calls back to those guys to go, hey, you know, do you remember this thing? Um, the, uh, in fact, we have a system protection engineer retiring today. Um, that you know will be a pain for us to uh, to get through to uh, to replace his knowledge. Um, so as the systems are able to cover more of those things and be more and more interoperable, plug and play, you know those things uh, we're not quite there yet. Plug and play sounds awfully nice. We're not quite there yet, but that's where we need to go. And basing things on standards and interoperable systems is going to really help make that cross function there. Recently we uh, uh, were, were looking at uh, putting a, uh, an OMS system in and the uh, person that runs our distribution system operations, he, uh, he commented about you know where our real-time systems group would be and there was a retirement there and he says, well maybe you want that and I'm like, well you know it's bad enough to be the guy that has to run the operations and so a storm rolls through and you call in the middle of the night and you gotta go take care of that. Today the IT guy has multiple storms. He has to be ready for that storm, and they now are a very integral part of when we have a uh, traditional thunderstorm, tornado, or whatever it is rolled through. IT is a very integral part of making sure that that operation works. Whereas back in the day, were the bills going out? Did we have to stop CIS in the middle of the night? That was pretty much the only concern of the IT. Now it's all integrated, and everything touches everything else. And the operational guys are very reliant on IT systems. An outage in IT is as important as an outage to uh, to customers or a major outage in a substation or on the line. <clears throat> Tom, good. Hey, Tom Kindred uh, with SAS Power from Canada. Um, for those in the room that aren't aware, where Saskatchewan is, uh, we're in the middle of uh, Canada, we're about the size of Texas. We have more telephone poles and power poles than we do people. <laughs> uh, and we operate from minus 40 to plus 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, so Woo. some pretty uh, extremes there to manage a, uh, a, a, a grid and uh, a power uh, industry. We're end-to-end -end, uh, a vertically integrated uh, uh, power company, so right from the generation, transmission, distribution. So tying all this together, um, I joined SAS Power about four years ago. Um, uh, my background is electrical engineering and also uh, electronic information systems engineering. And I happened to, uh, many years ago, start off in the telecommunication industry that's gone through very similar uh, transformation. If you think of back, way back when in the 80s, analog moving to digital, right? That doesn't sound like a big thing, but it was the same issue we have today. You had the digital folks and you had the analog folks, and they were two different camps. And the analog folks believed that there's going to be a, a, a renaissance of the analog world, and it never did happen. I remember doing presentations on digital uh, technologies and that, and people in the audience saying, well, when are you going to bring out some more analog stuff? You guys are always bringing out this digital stuff. And uh, I don't know what happened to that individual, but it certainly made me realize that uh, you know, things were changing and, and for good. I moved into the bank industry, was there for 10 years, and uh, uh, ended up at uh, Bank America um, in Canada. And again, through uh, similar uh, changes as well, if you think about the banking industry and moving from brick and mortar into uh, customer self service, how many people in the room here would rather go in and deposit money uh, versus uh, use uh, remote uh, services? You know, I know for me, uh, remote services uh, you know, would be the way I go. In fact, a lot of us probably haven't been to a bank in the past, uh, you know, past year here. So the things are changing, and not to repeat uh, what my uh, colleagues have said here, but the other thing that's changing is our consumers and our employees. And if we think about the consumerization of devices, <coughs> you used to come to work to get the most sophisticated de tools or devices you had. If you wanted a cell phone, you got that at work. You certainly didn't have your, your kids running around the school ground with a cell phone. And if you wanted a computer, you came to work for, for that to get the most advanced one. Now you have your employees that are coming that, you know, they have wireless networks at home, they store the music in the cloud, uh, they have the most advanced uh, wireless devices, and they're used to working that way. And to say, no, you can't work that way because we're a utility um, and haven't quite got there, I think that's going to add another change to this whole OTIT uh, convergence and uh, what does the worker of tomorrow look like? What does the worker of today look like that's replacing these people that are leaving, that have been with us 35, 45 years? Uh, and uh, you know, how do we educate the 
employees of, of tomorrow that don't want to work for 45 years. In fact, you talk to them and you say, if you work really hard, you can be here 35 years, their eyes roll back in their head. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to get them in and get them productive in, in, so that they can have a, a good career and uh, you know, probably looking at a 10-year uh, sort of uh, career with our company. So I'll just, uh, with that, maybe uh, use that as an open. Wade? Yeah, I'm Wade Malcolm with Accenture. And, uh, can't speak to uh, a, a particular utility experience uh, singularly. I've actually been involved in uh, our grid operations practices. I've been involved actually with some of you in the room and many other companies working with you on these types of projects. And uh, from you know, an ITOT perspective, uh, we, we talk about silos, silos being the issue. I, I think we're, we're still, what we're seeing is a shifting of silos. We're still going to have to deal with regulated versus uh, non-regulated, which I think you probably have to do with your market's role as well. Uh, we, we talked about security in some of the earlier sessions, and, and certainly critical infrastructure has been at least flagged in, in North America as something that has to be treated a little bit differently. Although may, you may opt not to treat it differently, it, it might be an audit and a reporting issue for you as well. Uh, but when we look at the silos, I, I mean, fundamentally, People want to bash the silos, knock them down. They were, they were created out of, uh, out of separate needs in the past. I mean, technology wasn't the same in the early days of moving from mechanical systems to applying uh, automated technology to the operation side. And a lot of that technology looked quite a bit different than the enterprise information technology did at that time. But I think the industry is facing two issues right now. Uh, one is that the underlying platforms are becoming more similar. The, the supporting technologies are, are very similar. While some of the update schedules and some of the other issues aren't necessarily the same, and at the same time, the industry is dealing with uh, some industry-wide pressures on environmental issues, uh, as well as customer choice and, and other aspects of, of market evolution as well. And, and both of these things really lend uh, to the need to share data across the organization. Uh, many of you have been involved in putting in smart meters. You have ubiquitous sensing and ubiquitous communications now. And you're finding that, that that data that was only used for billing in the past has value in a lot of other organizations. The process of sharing that data points to the needs to, to, to change the, the organizational structures, the silos that are there today, so that you can make effective use of the investments that you have. So I think we've been talking a lot about, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the issues of the silos, right, and some of the history. And I think we can agree that there are good reasons that those silos develop the way they are. Um, and I guess my, my coming in assumption was that, you know, we could say, well, smart grid is the driver for all of this. And I think what I've heard here is maybe it's not. So I don't know, Tom, you, you sound like you've, you've, you've seen some other drivers for this sort of, uh, uh, let's say, breaking down or, or reintegration of some of the utility operations. Well, there's no doubt that the, uh, the smart grid is one of the big drivers, but aging infrastructure, I think, is, uh, you know, certainly when you replace old infrastructure in a power plant and the new stuff that's coming out is, all computer-based, IP-enabled, you know, uh, you have a plant that's 50 years old uh, that's been working well, and then you upgrade it. Well, you know, the people who used to work on those things don't know how to support the stuff, that, the, the new stuff, how to do patches, how to keep that current. And uh, we did touch on the, uh, you know, uh, when we say aging assets, perhaps the people that are, are moving on uh, that have been with our companies a long time. And uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, knowledge here that is walking out the door. Uh, I think one of the things that certainly we're seeing in Canada, and I'm, I suppose it is elsewhere, is that when people retire nowadays, I'm not so sure it's like previous generations where people just want to say, okay, I'm done and, and hit the beach. I guess people that want to transition into retirement. So how do we, is there an opportunity to capture some of that knowledge and have people, I don't know, uh, the vision we have is uh, perhaps be available as subject matter expertise to the young, young folks that are there today. So something we're trying to do is, is put, uh, you know, uh, uh, high-speed uh, wireless uh, everywhere that our workers are out there. In fact, their trucks are becoming Wi-Fi hotspots. And the idea behind that is they're not tethered to the truck. It's not laptops and trucks. I think that's a, you know sort of the evolutionary path. You start there, but the next generation is, you know, how do they get access to uh, all the information they need? How do they call in a friend when they need a friend? <coughs> how do they uh, look at the equivalent of YouTube videos on your company and how to do processes? Uh, that's what they're used to. They're not used to plowing through classroom materials. So uh, how do they call in a retired person that's willing to work for a couple days a week to provide that assistance? I think just adding on to what Tom said in his introductory remarks was, uh, you know, he talked about analog versus digital. We're in, at that same juncture here where we've been very, very good at maintaining analog systems. We all have experts. The guy I talked about that's retiring today, 
He's an expert at that. Um, today you can't buy an a electromechanical relay. You know, so you're going to see that some of it's being driven by the fact that the technology is, uh, is moving at a pace and you know, vendors aren't even going to be providing things that will allow you to operate just within your silo. Absolutely. And uh, I wanted to follow up something you said earlier because I think you, you found yourself looking at more silos than you might have expected within just even your smart grid project, right? You were looking at, at how you were going to do some of this. And what are some of the things that maybe surprised you as you started looking into trying to do some integration across your organization? Well, I, I think that some of it was just a, a good portion of it's just traditional human nature. And before we had the, this IT, OT silo thing, we, we had lots of silos. All utilities had, other companies had silos. And trying to, to get over into the other silos, like, well, just leave me alone, stay over there, or you go talk to my boss. And then by the time it gets down to me, nothing will happen. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we've uh, that we've encountered on our project is, you know, the needing to touch so many of those silos, and the fact that we're doing a demonstration and we're not going enterprise with all the things we're doing, is it's been very easy for parties to say, well, you're just kind of working in the sandbox. I'm, 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 you know, do I really need to play along? As opposed to approaching it as, this is a great learning opportunity. We really should be trying to learn. And one of the ways that we've circumvented that is we've used mm -hmm. um, outside help. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, and it's, this is a shame to say this, but one of the, you know, some of the most, the most productive people on my project are contractors because that's their job. And when something breaks in the background, either be it uh, you know, traditional operations or something breaks in the background, bills aren't going out, the contractor's still there working on my project. So that's been a, a good leveling effect, and it brings some outside knowledge in. Of course, there's always some friction that goes along with that. But I think we need to, um, as utilities, be a little more open to bringing that in. And it's, you know, as, you're, as you're bringing these systems in and you're integrating them, my, my new mantra is integration is hard. I know the Siemens people want to say it's easy, but integration is hard. <laughs> and it's, you know, guys like Accenture or folks that are doing system integration or even Siemens Wing that does integration, um, you know, they're, uh, they, they do that for a living. Mm -hmm. And we operate a utility for a living. So, you know, bringing that outside help in that specializes in that area can help circumvent and get you through some of those silos, at least while you're bringing the systems up. Now, you still have to be able to go through change management to be able to operate them. I'm just going to add another driver to what we said earlier, and I think it's the, it's the one that is most important and, and the silent factor in, in all of the work that we do. But yet, if, if we're going to be successful over, over time, we're going to have to lift up this, this one driver and, and bring it into light and make sure that we recognize the, the purpose. Yesterday, we heard a comment that said there's one point. Two trillion dollars, I think it was one point three, one point three trillion dollars that's going to be invested in in this grid technology over the next twenty plus years. One point two trillion dollars. That's it's a lot of money. If the customer doesn't recognize the benefit of that investment, I don't think we're going to make it. I think we're going to we're going to come up short. We're going to, have to pull our poker chips off the table and, and you know go to something else. And so, what we really have to continue to think about is what is the driving purpose of the benefits of, or the functionality of this technology, and how do we how do we translate that into a language that is that the customer really gets? And so, um, when, I, when I see this term IT OT, I, I get a little lost there because we just in our world now we just call it technology. We don't really worry too much about if it's in house or out house or whatever. We call it technology, and we put a slash by there, and you need to put customer technology in there, customer service technology. But you know we. We have a slide that, that shows uh, uh, consumers today where they're all real time. Half of you right now are looking, you're looking at your phones, aren't you? Raise your hand. <laughs> and the reason is because you've got to have that information right now. You've got to. You've got to have the information. You can't wait 30 minutes. You've got to have it right now. Uh, so customers have got this driving impulse to, to get information right now. Utilities are so far behind that, that, that world. We're, we're, we're not even close. We're so far behind. So we've got to get our customer technology systems in place to where as we digitize our grids and we provide real valuable information that helps us operate and manage the grid, that we can also translate that into a, a language where the customer says, thank you, I appreciate that, and let me reply back to you with a little bit more requests. It could be around their energy usage, it could be around 
their, their thermostat at their house. It could be around the outage that just took place that's going to cause them a problem at their home. Whatever the, the, the event is, how well are we communicating with them? And, oh, by the way, they don't want a telephone anymore. Right. They want an email. They want a, they want a I don't know what they want. They want all kinds of ways. So you've got to be, you got to be able to hit multiple, multiple channels at all times. And that is tough in today's yeah. world. Very, very tough for you. So I was actually teeing up to ask you a question to follow that one up because I think the next question I want to ask, I'm going to, now I'm going to address it to, to Wade because the people issue in the organization and the organizational structure to do what you've just outlined, right, is a big one. And I think that's, that's it's part of the silos, but it's how do you organize, right? How do you, and how do you look at successfully trying to, to move an organization and the people towards this and the change management? So. Yeah, no, that, and I think that's a, that's a key point. You know, you asked a moment ago, is it just the smart grid that's, that's driving some of this? And I mean, I th we heard there's a variety of, of issues around demographics as well as external forces that, that are affecting and creating this opportunity for this large technology investment. But we, we really can't afford to just replace in kind, which is traditionally what we've done until we've hit key milestones. Like, Bill, I think you mentioned the, the analog to digital transition. We're, we're in another one of those again. And, and the, the increasing need for customer focus. So, so what, what we really see is that for folks to benefit from the technology investment, uh, that they need to look at their business processes. They need to restructure. They need to implement change management so that it doesn't become a, a replacement in kind. I, I think, Bill, you mentioned you're, you're in the process of going to a new outage management system. I mean, I, I think about you know, when, when I worked at uh, Pico Energy years and years ago, uh, when a storm hit and there were outages, there, there were a few smart people in the room. This is, again, decades ago, but those few smart people in the room had limited data to work with, but they knew the system, they had operational experience, they made a lot of the decisions, they communicated it to their operational staff, but it took a long time to get that information out to the, the customer folks, and uh, there was really never any checks and balances because of the nature of the way the information was available and shared. I don't think today we, we could do that in, in a main storm. If, if you look at with Superstorm Sandy, if you look at many of the hurricanes, uh, you have to, in real time, communicate that, the status of your system with a variety of internal and external stakeholders in a way that, that wasn't done 20 years ago. And, and it's really in that context that trying to find a way to take advantage of these advanced technologies that we have the opportunity to install and what we found is you can very easily get mired in, you know, organizational debate. You know, what does this do to my organization? What does it do to me? And so what we found is, is you really have to kind of look at the corporate objectives, determine what functions need to take place to meet those corporate objectives, and, and use that functional drive as a way to restructure the organization rather than look at traditional pieces. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in system operations that's very dependent on IT technologies. We had, we had a client that... You know, their IT organization was upgrading modem firmware and digital cellular modems on their SCADA system at the same time a storm was about to roll through. It wasn't a very comfortable situation. So yeah. you, you need to have that kind of coordination, and you need to take it beyond that and really find a way to leverage this. And so what we're finding is a, a, a coordinated business process redesign activity combined with change management tracking with that technology investment uh, really allow us to get to the objectives of, of making the customer and other external stakeholders, municipal agencies, as well as other operating groups within the utility more informed, as, as, as Ken had mentioned. Nice to jump on that. Um, it, is I think a lot of the IT organizations in the uh, uh, power industry, uh, a lot of them have historically been transactional IT departments um, and, uh, you know, desktop, uh, CIS systems, things like that. And, then all of a sudden tell your operations folks that these people are going to come in and help work on the critical infrastructure, their eyes sort of glaze back in their head again. And uh, so I think for us, our big thing uh, at SAS Power was to get the trust. And part of getting the trust is understanding. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things we had to do is get rid of all of the IT magazines and the IT mindsets in IT and start putting in, you know, Power World and, and different magazines <laughs> to start people seeing that. We had people that had been the vocabulary. In, well, exactly. We had people that had been in our, our IT organization for 15 years and never been to a power plant. So we send buses every. That's a good question for the audience. How many people here have been to a power plant? 
All right, good for you. So we send uh, we send buses uh, four times a year to different power uh, power stations around the province and the substations. Uh, and the rule is you just have to work for us for one year and only one. And we send uh, vendors as well. Mm -hmm. So the idea is how do you get that trust and, and, and I think more strategically getting entwined with where the business wants to go with technology. And a lot of times a business is too busy doing their business to understand what the ad evolution of path you know, looks like. How do you move from smart grid? Uh, how do you move to advanced distribution management system? How do you move to uh, you know, all, the, uh, all the technologies, asset management, et cetera? And how do they all inter interlink? So, so I think part of the challenge with that has been, um, you know, bring together the stuff that makes sense. That's how we started. There's the no-brainer stuff. Uh, uh, it, it, I say that, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of challenge in that. But there's things like your communications networks, your your data centers, your um, bridges, your firewalls, your uh, the underlying infrastructure, servers, routers. Uh, those things you can get a lot of efficiencies and you can share a lot of the operational experience and that's an area where IT probably shines better mm -hmm. than the OT side. So is telecom part of your IT organization? Yes, so telecom is. Uh, I have uh, after five fiber deployment crews that work for me and, and telecontrol is another part of my organization. Um, and the idea is uh, that was a no-brainer stuff pulling that together, a huge amount of efficiencies that have been found in that. Uh, because we all had our own organizational structures. We had the operational wide area network. We had the IT infant, uh, area network. We had the hidden networks that the OT folks didn't want the IT folks to know about. We, you know, I think we had 14 <laughs> networks. <laughs> yeah. So how do you pull this together? You know, and I, then I think the next part of the journey is then how far do you go from there? And I think that that's going to be different for a lot of uh, companies. Do you get, how far do you get into the substation automation? Do you stop at the communications or do you take it a step further? How far do you get into the power control systems and the SCADA systems? Do you run the, the hardware and the application and let the operational folks take it from there and do the, the, you know, the patches and all that? Or do you do that? And I think that's going to be a bit dependent on your utility. So. so I was going to go back to Kenny on the question because I think that raises a topic that's really critical here, which is the whole issue of security. <clears throat> and you know, you just touched on a, a pretty deep dive into some pretty important equipment and automation and so forth. And how have you guys been looking at the issue of cybersecurity? And I guess most, mostly, how are you organizing uh, and how do you manage the cybersecurity issues at CenterPoint? Yeah, I mean, uh, security is, is top of mind. It's, it's interesting. We, we, we there are a lot of different perspectives on, on the protection of our grids. We, we we manage the grid and secure the grid independent of how we secure our corporate IT. There are two different levels of security, two different <coughs> designs, two different uh, areas completely managed, unique to their responsibilities in, 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 our, in our business. And so we have experts who for the last 30 years have been focused on grid security, grid management, grid security, and, and, and work, work with Siemens with, in our energy management system, ha making sure that, that our systems and their integration into our networks continue real time day in and day out 24 7 to have a high level of security at the corporate level you know you get so much more volume I mean at the corporate level that's where all the tax come that's where you get high volume high levels of crazy stuff comes in comes out and so our, our expertise is just different because they're seeing so much different stuff right and, and and they're becoming very expert at reacting to all that stuff and having a plan to contain it and, and ship it away uh, but at the same time, they've become very, very uh, good at, and a couple of them are here in the room today, at proactively designing infrastructural improvements that help further our job of reducing the risk. And risk, risk management is a big part of what we focus on, understanding what those potential vulnerabilities are, knowing what we know in the industry, working with the national and the state and, uh, and, and local governmental areas, listening and participating. We, we quantify our risk. We stay very focused on mitigation of those risks. Um, but I tell you, what, the, the, what this really kind of starts to, to drive is resiliency, right? How resilient is our grids as we think through the future uh, of technology? And, you know, right now we're, just, we're building a brand new uh, energy backup control center. That backup control center is designed to provide us in less than one hour full visibility in a second location. If something, somebody attacked one location, we're ready to move, and we have real-time access, and we have real-time capabilities at that second center. But in addition to, to, to that fundamental requirement, what we're also looking at it is the backup for corporate, for, for 
metering systems, for distribution management systems, for telecommunication systems. So from a resiliency perspective, we always want to be live two places. Mm -hmm. So if you attack us, okay, great. You know, maybe you're, you're, someday you might be able to hit, but we're going to keep fighting, keep defending, keep holding you back. But if you do, resiliency becomes an, an alternative. How do we roll? Now, there's a third level of resiliency that we've been working at really hard is imagine going back to that 1920s day when we didn't have the technology. We've, we've, got, we've got plans in place now. We don't even need a CIO. I'm sorry to tell you this, but, <laughs> Tom, your job is, is, is no longer needed. <laughs> That's great. Because if, in the worst-case scenario, we're going to go back to Morse code and, and uh, <laughs> simple transportation and simple, Smoke. simple Smoke. routines that we used to do 30, 40 years ago when we didn't have technology, make sure that we can get that grid back in place. So looking at it from the lowest level of, of technology to the highest level of technology kind of gives you a path of, of resiliency that hopefully for the long term will protect us. Yeah, and Bill, you've had a chance now to, to go through a project where you've done a lot of, you've done a lot of applications, right? You're, you're doing a lot of automation up and down through the chain. I guess I would ask the question of you, you know, which of those have, have you know, uh, have, have proven to be the most challenging because of this transition between maybe a control center and, you know, the data center? <clears throat> most challenging. Uh, I would, there's a lot of equivalency in challenge. Um, you know, it's a, a matter of sequencing and time and when we put certain things in. We, we, uh, um, you know, we took an opportunity to learn from many of our peers as we were installing our, uh, our smart meters, which we've now decided not to call them smart meters, they're advanced meters, um, which we've had for 20 years. So, um, the, uh, but when we were plugging the meters in, we said we need to deliver value on day one. What, what's in it for the customer? And so we, uh, you know, we had hired a company called Tendril, and uh, they stood their uh, web portal up, and, and we distributed in-home displays the same day that we plugged the meter in, which, by the way, is a lesson learned is not recommended. Uh, <laughs> if you want to talk to me about that, I'll talk to you about that in the hall. That's a good lesson that we'll be sharing through our DOE reporting. Um, but, uh, you know, we distributed that so the customer, because the customer doesn't care about the meter. You know, so we tried to learn from what was going on back in 2010. Um, you know, you couldn't read anything on a blog that wasn't uh, bash and smart meters. Mm -hmm. So, but each project has had its level of integration and or in that case, we had to build some point-to-point -point interfaces that we had to now undo and then go through our enterprise service bus. Um, security, um, you know, I, I waver all over the place on security. Um, the uh, you know, being the smart grid guy, I'm on some somewhat of an island. You know, we're trying to implement the NISTER standards, which of course aren't even all ready. So, you know, it's emerging standards, and uh, you know, so at some point you've got to decide what you're going to build. Um, we've had struggles going to the vendors to say, please open the hood and show me that you're following these standards that you've said you follow, and it's like. Boy, I really don't want to open up the hood and show you that, or that's a lot of work to show you that I'm me Just trust me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've had difficulty uh, doing some of those items. Uh, but each, each piece of integration and making sure and verifying that uh, things are complying with the standards, that's kind of been about the, what the challenge has been mm -hmm. along the way there. And, and in the past, you know, we probably have uh, not paid as much attention there as, uh, as we probably should have. It's like, well... A is talking to B, a patch was put in, a patch was put in, a patch was put in. We patched it from the other side. Two people retired and nobody knows what's in there. Yeah. So, I understand. So, Wade, is this, is this a common thing globally? I mean, as you look around the world, is, are there other countries that don't seem to have the same kinds of issues, or, or is this something you see everywhere? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think the issues are, are, are more similar than different. The causes are, are, are a little bit different by, by different regions. So to give you an example, you know, you, as you're standing up all these applications, I was, I was wondering whether you're going to talk about quality of existing data, things like that. But, but so, for example, d data quality, as, as, uh, as folks start to put in LMS, DMS, EMS systems, replacements, uh, they, they start to look at management systems, the, the quality of the data going in, and a lot of times if, if you don't do that cleaning or the scrub or get it right, it's going to directly impact the benefits realization on, on the back end. We, we've had that typically in North America from the, the manual records being converted over to automated. But, but for example, in Asia, the difference is, you know, so in China in particular, the assets are going in so quickly that while they have an asset registry, while they have a GIS, they, they don't necessarily have the ability to get it in and get it in fast, in, in fast enough and in a quality that, that can make a lot of the advanced operational technologies pay off. So, so I mean, that's, 
that's one place. Uh, one, one that we've seen that's probably more similar than different is, is security, though. And, and again, it, it, interfacing the legacy systems has been a challenge a, across all the regions. Mm -hmm. Asia's had the benefit of leapfrogging some of that with some of the advanced technologies they've been able to install in, in, in some regions as well. So uh, I, I would say there are similar problems with different causes based on each region. Uh, yeah. I thought the comments this morning from, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, from FERC, was interesting because it's something that I've said. I spent a lot of time in distribution automation, and I know we uh, we used uh, SNCs and teleruptors where they had a Wi-Fi connection. It was like, oh my goodness, someone's going to break in through there, and they're going to take down the whole grid. And I'm like, well, you just drive a truck into it and drive it, knock it down. And you know, the concern about physical security. I mean, let's face it, two jets were flown into the World Trade Center. You place those jets into a couple of places around our country doesn't take a rocket scientist to see a whole bunch of big sticks going into a place that I got to fly home today. So, <laughs> um, you know, so uh, I think we all we need to be as concerned about physical security as well. Um, we're probably paying an, an unbalanced amount of attention to cybersecurity and good old fashioned. Uh, That's because we're in the ID. good old fashioned tactics will uh, uh, will will cause probably more damage than what could yep. be. Um, done through those meetings. definitely would agree with that I think yeah. you know we heard yesterday in, in part of that that same discussion about the uh, uh, the impact and the possibilities for cyber attacks or even physical attacks that the gas network is actually you know probably even more vulnerable and, and yeah. more potentially destructive so Tom you have a gas affiliate company we do yeah we have Sask Energy in fact they're part of our uh, smart grid uh, deployment uh, we we have uh, gas uh, and electrical coming back over our AMI solution but uh, you know, we do, because of the diversity of the province, the physical uh, is certainly a challenge for us. And uh, one of the things that we have is, you talk about silos, the power industry and the power generation, they even had silos per each plant. Usually the person that was a plant manager was God at that particular plant. Mm -hmm. So uh, to go in there and try putting some centralized standards around security, um, you know, you'd have your ID badge that would work in one plant, the next plant would be using palm recognition, you go to a hydro plant way up north, and uh, there's nobody at the security desk. You signed in, and it was the honor system. Right? <laughs> and uh, it's a form of security exactly, itself. Yeah. You have, you have you know, yeah. disparate security yeah. systems. Yeah. So, yeah. so nobody sure. can get in, and nobody can get in everywhere. I'm sure the bad guys are going to sign in. Um, <laughs> that's, that's defense in depth. Yeah. But you'll be wearing a hard hat. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, and as you get further north, because you're such part of the community, uh, the hydro dam was also the uh, place for this, the, uh, the main route for the skidoos to cross in the wintertime. And, uh, you know, the fishing spot, the best place to back the, the uh, boats in was right through the power uh, station yard there. So, you know, all different types of security. And, uh, you know, you go into the power plant itself, uh, they have the old relay room, uh, which now they're modernizing. and. You know, as they put IP stuff in there, they still call it the relay room, but there's probably not as many relays in there today. Uh, but it's wide open. Uh, one of our main plants, you can, it's a shortcut to the lunchroom, right? And, uh, you know, you think about... Everybody here in this room is going to have to sign an NDA yeah, before leaving yeah, yeah. the door. <laughs> but, but you think about the vulnerabilities there. You just need one disgruntled employee, and uh, they can go in there and wreak havoc, uh, more so than a control room, because a control room... Uh, you know, you can do a lot of stuff there, but uh, the system will still operate. If you take the equipment in the relay remote, the plant's, plant's out of commission will take a long time to bring back up. So what does it take to put, you know, a fence or a wall around there with, uh, you know, the IT sort of standard? I, I'm, uh, as a CIO and, and also responsible for security, I don't have access to any of our data centers. I have to go in with somebody else in our company. Because I have no need to be there other than to take tours there. And that's not, uh, that's not, doesn't pass the smell test as far as needing access. So either that or they realize what kind of damage I'll do by poking at things when I walk through. But, <laughs> but you know, you, you think about taking away that change from a culture, people that are used to walking through there, the plant manager going wherever he wants or she wants in the plant and saying, you know, you can no longer go in there. There's only three people that are allowed in that room now. That's a huge change. Mm -hmm. We've only got a couple minutes left, uh, but I think uh, maybe we'll uh, see if there's a question or two in the audience we can try to address. So, anybody have uh, has something they'd like to? Uh, Something's burning out there. I know it is. Anybody want to know more about the details of how to take down the grid? <laughs> <laughs> Something's burning. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess I'll give I give each of these guys a, a chance to just sort of you know 
throw a few thoughts out there. We've got a couple minutes left, and uh, if we have any questions, go ahead and throw your hand up. The, 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 you know, the utility industry is changing dr dramatically right now. If you, if you go back in time, it, this was a muscle company. I mean, these companies were built off of hard work, sweat, you know, putting poles in the ground, running wire, um, a lot of big construction projects, very physical work, very laborious work, very strong, masculine work, right? It's just the way it was 40, 50 years ago. All that's changing. Some of that work never goes away, but a lot of the work that we're, we're, that we're designing today is changing the, the who, the face of, of what a utility is going to be in the future. Maybe the word utility has to be replaced. Maybe we have to be changed in, in, in the name of what, who, what we are, what we represent in terms of society. We have to translate the, the value of what we're, what we're producing each and every day. We need to translate that into a language that the customer says, I get it. You know, we got to give it, we need to send it to them. Make sure that they really appreciate what the work that we're doing. It's not all blood and sweat anymore. It's a lot more intellectual focus with data, data analytics, applications, deep solutions, um, looking at stuff with, with real-time fingers on, on, on systems and being able to produce things and, at, at a speed that we never ever thought we could do 10 years ago. And by the way, that speed's only going to get faster five years from now than where we are now. But I, I'm just thrilled to be part of this industry change that's going on. And I just think three to five years from now, I'd love to come back and tell you some great things that we're going to be doing at our business because the things we're doing right now are, are good. The things that I'll be doing in three years are, are, are really great. They're going to be really great. And, I, you know, that's what makes me proud to be a, a, a participant in this industry. I think we uh, uh, tagging on to that. Uh, customer engagement. Um, you know, we're, we're not an industry that's uh, used to doing literally any marketing. Um, show of hands, how many people in the room read their last bill insert from either the gas or the electric? <laughs> Not even one? Wow, oh, one. Okay, we got a couple back there. All right. How many people? You know, you maybe, know. maybe they read it electronically, but. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not an effective technique to communicate with customers. We've tried a, a variety of ways to reach out, and even through our project, we spent a good deal of money marketing and trying to get customers engaged and to accept the, the products that we're doing. Um, we are right in the heart of Midtown Kansas City, a good portion of our projects in a uh, uh, economically uh, downtrodden area. Um, but we've really struggled to get customers engaged and, and find ways to do that. So we've got a, a, these systems... And, and ultimately, we have to have customers accept it. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to have a, a, a energy efficiency and demand response that's you know beyond the meter, uh, and customers participating, and you know, in Kansas City is in the heart of uh, you know in the heartland where you know we don't have the pricing that you have on the coast, we don't have the competitive nature that you have down in Texas, um, and we have you know pretty stodgy regulatory market that's like, well, let's see what everybody else is doing before we even. <laughs> put, our, put our toe in the water. So, um, you know, we're usually pressing them. And then so they'll question, well, you're going to put all these fancy tools in to communicate to all these customers, but not everybody has a smartphone. You know, mm -hmm. so who's paying for that? So, you know, it's, uh, we still have those regulatory hurdles to get over. You run those numbers, and it's probably cheaper to include a smartphone for those right, customers. Right. It, well, that's, that, that's, we need to think new ways like that. <laughs> and, and we don't tend to, to be the type that do think those ways. So we need, I, I heard this morning about the, you know, hiring the, the candy company and, mm -hmm. you know, create some eye candy. When we have the most, the product that people rely on the most. <clears throat> and, you know, but we've, we've also been a monopoly and haven't had to market it. You know, you pretty much got to buy it from us and there may be a day where you don't have to buy it from us. It's here. Huh? <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, if you think 15 years ago, what the internet looked like, and the Ebays and the Amazons and all these different things. And you think about today's generation that is coming to our companies that have never known life without the Internet, without a computer, versus those of us that are trying to be CIOs and CTOs that, you know, uh, got the Internet in our 30s and are trying to decide how it's going to look in the, different, in, in the future. Look at the challenges the Internet had relative to massive data and how you mine that data and how you get it. Now we think nothing about going on to Google or, or Bing and typing in something and it finds the information right away. I would suggest that what we're deploying today is just the start of the industry. And maybe uh, 
you know, if you look out here five years and ten years from now, and, I, and probably not even that long, if you look at how do we organize the, uh, you know, the, uh, all the data that we have coming in in some organized fashion so that it can be uh, uh, found, do we need, you know, big databases or do we need tools like web crawlers and things like that that, that mine stuff internal to our company? How do we make it real for our employees of tomorrow so that, you know, they just need to ask something like they're asking Siri on their iPhone, you know, do I need an umbrella today? Siri knows where you are, knows that you're asking about the weather and reports back, yeah, you need an umbrella. Why do we need to force employees to check one of the following three things and if you know the hexadecimal equivalent of it, you can put it in and, you know, that's a lot of the tools that we have today in our companies and I'd suggest that five years from now, a lot of that's going to change. A lot of tools that haven't been invented are going to be invented and bought into our industry as the need arises. So stay tuned, very exciting. And maybe just on that point, I mean, the session was on IT, OT, blending the silos for maximum benefit We're very early on. Uh, fortunately, thanks to pioneers like these folks on the, on the panel, we, we have a lot of tools today that we didn't have a few years ago in terms of reference architectures, in terms of use case repositories, things that, that we can use to, to collectively advance the, the state of the industry to go forward, and that, that's proven to be very valuable. So I, I would recommend that everyone look to those references that are out there from the projects that have been undertaken. They're, they're very valuable. I think going forward, though, uh, it'll be interesting to see. I think the, the one thing we've heard more and more now is we're starting to get critical mass on data. Uh, we're starting to see some early results from a lot of the projects that are underway. And uh, I think everyone is anticipating the, the wave towards analytics and uh, using analytics to kind of do yet one more generational update or change to, to what we have in the field is, is coming. So I'm going to follow on with that. Uh, one, one comment, and you'll be able to attend some of the analytics sessions that are later on today and tomorrow. But I think one of the things that we started to see is that when you start putting that data that you've got into some format that's easily accessible, usable, that starts to bring together people from all parts of the organization. So uh, I think, you know, personally I will look at data analytics as at least one catalyst for at least a shared value proposition in these investments that will span the organization in a way that's quite productive. Um, anyway, I want to thank the panelists and uh, really appreciate you guys uh, joining us today and uh, great observations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this has been um, the official first part of the, of the general session. Thank you again for that entertaining and, and no, a fruitful conversation, above all. Um, a couple of things, um, we're running 25 minutes late. Um, so if you go to your guys, and it was, it was just worth it, thanks again. So. <laughs> and then you're not to blame for it anyway. But um, uh, if you go, five of those, okay, good. Well, the smallest amount, right? Um, if you go to your guidebook and um, go to update content, we push the day back a little. Um, so we're, essentially all the, all the schedules uh, will be updated in the guidebook so you are at the right time at the right place. We're going to be reconvening back here at 4.15 um, and learn about um, how Aleander is going to use IT to sort of transition their energy business and how Accenture proposes to cut through the data. Um, flurry. Yeah. So thanks and have a good day till afternoon. Thank you again. Lars, the floor is yours. So thanks everybody for uh, for joining us for this. We have uh, a few questions that have come in, and I'd like to encourage people to uh, uh, submit some more questions if uh, if uh, if you have them through the web uh, uh, buttons on your screen here. Um, I guess there's been a lot of uh, discussion about the the kinds of of things that are driving the ITOT conversions here, and I think there's a lot of good observations from folks who have been very much engaged in in uh, those kinds of projects. And one of the questions was, you know, is this being driven a lot by by information coming from meters? And I think, you know, it's absolutely true that that you know uh, on a global basis, the uh, majority of uh, uh, people are are able to, uh, uh, are, you know, are basically uh, the programs are driving uh, smart metering as a initial entry into this space. And of course, then that's uh, causing the, uh, the the bulk of the data that is. Um, uh, that is coming into this pro these these kinds of uh, these kinds of programs. So there's a there's certainly a lot of uh, metering information that is uh, you know uh, driving driving this, but it's certainly not the only information that's coming in. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of uh, smart sensors and devices that are being put out on the distribution grid as we we take the kind of SCADA and telemetry and uh, distribution management down from 
you know, the substation level into the feeders and, uh, again, ultimately to uh, the metering devices where, again, today the bulk of the information is, is coming from. Um, I also wanted to, to let people know this uh, this panel was was conducted at the Siemens uh, Smart Grid Leadership Conference uh, that was held uh, in June uh, in San Francisco, and um, the uh, the attendees uh, you know were were clearly uh, uh, folks looking to to learn more about uh, all aspects of the smart grid. Um, and one of the questions that that came in here and uh, today was was also about advice for for uh, emerging markets where. Um, you know, perhaps there's a chance to maybe you know do things from 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 scratch, maybe, or or to to uh, to see the process of changing changing lots of systems at the same time. And I, I think there's um, uh, there's there's definitely uh, places in the world today where where you know that that leapfrog effect is is going on. We see that in, in certainly in parts of Asia and China, for example, where you know. Uh, you know, millions and millions of meters are being deployed that have uh, varying degrees of intelligence, but are basically providing advanced telemetry. You know, in all parts of the grid, and I think you know these these kinds of uh, objectives. Uh, you know, to, to quote Kenny Mercado from Centerpoint, um, you know, are basically saying this is just technology. This isn't IT or OT in particular. Um, so I think as we look at the emerging markets, we look at those areas where we have uh, maybe uh, you know an opportunity to to make changes that. You know, some of this uh, view is to really say, look, we are we're providing automation and telemetry and control that is able to uh, to help us, uh, you know, operate this power system, engage with our customers, and provide these these kinds of uh, uh, efficiencies that that we need. Uh, and we don't have to uh, to to go by sort of the old operating models of uh, you know separate silos of generation, transmission, distribution. You know, and customer, and and have them operate completely independently. We can we can take a more holistic view of how that's going to work. Um, that's certainly a uh, uh, sort of a future-looking paradigm here, where the uh, the approach to uh, how grids work is really going to be uh, built around this idea of you know bidirectional power flow, customers engaged in not only consuming power but also generating power. Um, having new kinds of loads and electric vehicles always come to mind, but I think we'll see other loads like uh, storage units and uh, and new kinds of uh, uh, energy consumption that will be, you know, somewhat different than what we've seen. I think all of those things are going towards the changes that we see here in the in the smart grid, and it's it's uh, it's really very exciting to to watch that. But I think uh, as we as we see what's going on right now with uh, the technology, it's certainly driving sort of a new way of organizing. And uh, adopting, you know, new operating policies and new procedures that that take advantage of the technology, and I think all of that is uh, tending to, uh, let's say, maybe levelize the organizations a little bit and and uh, cross pollinate uh, uh, the cultures between these different operating units, uh, so that that I think we we will see uh, uh, this ITOG uh, convergence or essentially elimination of even the concept of having separate uh, technology stacks. So with that, I think we're at the top of the hour. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for uh, joining the, uh, the, uh, the webinar this morning, um, and uh, uh, good luck in uh, your own Smart Grid programs. Thank you very much.